Welcome to Superhero Rundown. I'm Jess, and today in this video we'll be discussing something that I have no inside experience on. I know trans people, I know about the struggles, but I'm not trans myself. Luckily I do know someone who is. So, bye! Hi, welcome to Superhero Rundown. I'm Aspiri, and today we're talking about the Swordsman movies, in particular Dong Feng Bu Bai, known as Asia the Invincible from here on. Normally I'm behind the camera, so this will be a whole thing. Let's get started. Let's sort a couple things out here at the start. The character and the characters surrounding her can be read in a lot of different ways. Regardless, art being the way that it is, this is the reading we're going with. Kiddo is testing their comfortability with the idea before transitioning. We really aren't going to talk about it that much, but it's worth noting. Asia is in transition in Swordsman 2, and post-transition in the East is Red. I'll not be taking comments or questions on Red Commenter. The Swordsman series is based on the novel The Smiling Proud Wanderer. A Wuja novel itself, it was adapted into a series of Wuja movies, as well as a few TV adaptations. The movies, while borrowing heavily from the novel, take a lot of liberties with the story. It centers around a scroll called the Sunflower Manual, which teaches a powerful and magical martial art. It requires a person to castrate themselves in order to learn it. The movie serves to set up the scroll and the world and legend surrounding it. In the second movie, it's revealed that Asia has acquired the scroll and has taken the needed steps to start learning it. In the process, they become more feminine, culminating in her fully becoming a woman by the end of the movie. In the third movie, The East is Red, Asia seeks to remove imitators to her name and reputation, which to me feels like trying to uproot all the endless references to your dead name. This movie hits a lot of points that are sometimes uncomfortably close to home. Kiddo trying to hide their body whenever someone other than Ling is in the room, Asia dealing with her lover reacting poorly to her transition, Wu, the former leader of Asia's cult, being an incredibly transphobic dick and mocking her. It, yeah, it hurts to see those things on screen. That last example in particular brings up an interesting point. In Brandon Goes to Hollywood, Boys Don't Cry in the Transgender Body in Film, the author points out, the history of the masculine woman in culture and in film is also bound to the history of the female body. The female and feminized body must be kept under control, rigidly stylized, and differentiated from that of the male-slash-masculine body. In other words, if women lose as an old age or reject their femininity and hence appear mannish or masculine, if they begin to blur or challenge the clear-cut boundaries between the two genders, then men and male bodies are implicated in cultural definitions and perception of the female body as unclean, corrupting, and sinful. The fear is not only that women will become more like men, but that men will become more like women. And nobody knows the brutal application of that fear like the LGBT community and trans people in particular. There's a concept of the trap where people, typically men, justify brutality and even murder of a trans person for tricking or trapping them in a sexual situation that would make them be gay for interacting with what they perceive as male genitalia. Now we don't have time to unpack all of that, but being gay really, really doesn't work that way. Gender is, in my experience, about performance and not physical structures. The structure's a penis. Like every skyscraper. Good luck getting that out of your head. Bridget Lin, the amazing actress that plays Asia the Invincible, that is so fun to say, does a great job of towing the line in Swordsman 2 between male and female. As in the Swordsman films, Lin uses her body posture and mannerisms to delimit the difference between yang and yin foregrounding the social and cultural construction of gender by demonstrating once again that gender is performative rather than iterative through the inscription and embodiment of both male and female principles into the same body. There's a lot of characters that blur the lines in this. Kiddo drifting between masculine and feminine presentation, Snow playing the male Asia while also being an intensely stoic femme fatale, Ling playing the lighthearted fool but having a skill with the sword that is nearly indomitable. 
The relationship of hero, villain, and fool types is perhaps best understood by considering them as kinds of deviants from the normative center of conventional conduct. The three directions of deviation might be described as one, better than, two, falling short of, or three, antagonism to the standards required of all group members. That is, the fool is subnormal by defect of intelligence, sobriety, and competence, whereas the villain is countermoral, and the hero might be called supernormal from the titles implied to him, such as Invincible Champion, Demigod, Superman. Mm -hmm. Another way these lines get blurred is Asia herself. She walks this line of hero and villain, myth and mortal, mercy and murder. Which is interesting, but problematic. Far too often, trans people are portrayed as psychopaths, perverts, predators, and punchlines. And very rarely do we see them portrayed as real, valid people. This makes way for ill-informed and ill-intentioned people to make us out to be those things they see on screen, which leads to dangers in our real, valid people lives, both in the form of violence and neglect. While theorists have expounded the virtues and political importance of reflection on gender, transsexual women themselves have confronted realities outside of the narrow scope of gender as a concept. For more than 20 years, transsexuals who are somewhat older, 40 and over, have witnessed the horrific consequences of HIV in our communities, burying friends, lovers, and co-workers over and over again. The past 20 years have seen the loss of an entire generation of transsexual women, dead to AIDS, suicide, overdose, or murder by a client. Transsexual women age with an unsettling knowledge that many of us, often most of us, do not live to be 40 years old. Every day, transsexual women see our work, lives, community organizing, and even personal relationships criminalized through an invocation of prostitution laws. Clearly, this isn't an issue exclusive to trans women, but it affects us a lot. And those that don't experience the worst of it are very aware of those that do. This unfair portrayal of trans people puts our lives as trans women at risk every day. Well, I don't see trans people dying in the streets. It's not that bad. Yeah, there's the neglect that pairs with the violence. Dozens of trans women die every year. The notable ones are the murders and suicides. At least 26 women in 2019, more in 2018. And that's just the ones known about in the U.S. alone. The numbers worldwide are sickening. I encourage you to look at the Human Rights Campaign's website. They have lists. Seven years worth of lists. Wikipedia has a list of trans people who have been killed for being trans. Names go back to 1980. It's rarely reported on. If you don't see it, then look at it instead of dismissing it. These things, this fear, doesn't just change the way people act around us. It changes the way we act around other people and around ourselves. Not just in ways like being closeted or dressing in drabs and things like that, but in some really stark ways that are shown in this series. There's a through line in this about not only the Sunflower Manual, but also the scroll that belongs to the two masters of the Sun Moon Holy Cult. A song that they wrote called Zhao Ao Zhang Hu, which just so happens to be a really nice nod to the original title of the novel. There are a lot of really good versions of this song, but I'll have a link to one of my favorites down in the description. This song is an absolute banger, and I refuse to be told otherwise. This song is a source of endless shenanigans in the first two movies, but it subtly highlights something. Kiddo doesn't sing a single part of it in the scene where it's introduced. Ling and the two masters play and sing, Kiddo is smiling but silent. In the second movie, Asia doesn't speak directly with Ling until after her metamorphosis has already altered her voice. For a lot of us, our voices are a source of intense discomfort. Our voices, particularly for trans women, are one of the things that gives us away when we're trying to pass. I all but gave up on singing because I can't stand to listen to the sound of my own voice. It gives me really strong panic attacks. Ivy and I would normally be doing the editing on this, but for that exact reason, Jess will be working on this one exclusively. There are ways to help eliminate these toxic preconceptions. Casting departments can cast trans actors as trans characters and not... 
you know, Scarlett Johansson. Writers can talk to people who have lived the experiences of the gay and lesbian and trans and non-binary characters that they want to put in their stories. Studios can stop being chicken shit about taking risks and actually put out stories that represent us. People will go to see movies that show us, show our lives. We want to see ourselves on screen, not cis people, not caricatures of LGBT people, but stories that represent us and who and how we are in life. And I think we're getting to a point where we can push harder than ever to make that happen. Streaming services give a big boost to independent creators. Platforms like YouTube let you put out your shows and movies and animations and art that shows who you are. It's Pride Month, a time to be proud of who you are, a time to celebrate your existence, and a time to be defiant against what would normally keep you down. In the description, you'll find links to a few resources for helping you out if you're trans or any other flavor of LGBT. Even if it's not particularly safe for you to come out, and I know how that feels, there are resources you can reach out. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We are valid and absolute magic for being able to fight through everything the world throws at us. And every footprint you leave on the world through art or activism or just being there for someone is a step taken to making LGBT creators and people more and more visible. Superhero Rundown does it twice a month and we'll keep doing it for as long as it takes to see that change through. When it's hard to look in the mirror, just remember that the person is not the body. The things you do and the way you act are far, far more important than how you look. Look for the person, not the body. And remember that there will always be people that love you at the end of the day.